Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to uh, our kickoff uh, event for SAIS Rethinking Iran for fall of 2021. I'm Vali Nasser, a professor at uh, Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. And for those who are familiar with uh, Rethinking Iran, this is our uh, initiative in order to introduce new ideas, uh, new great authors, scholars to discussion about Iran uh, at a particularly important point uh, in US-Iran relations and to help broaden the perspective of how we understand Iran and its policies, its society and, and politics. And we have a great set of events coming up for this fall, uh, which I encourage you to check on our website. Uh, but today, I'm particularly pleased that we are starting this, uh, our, our fall uh, set of events uh, hosting uh, Tara Kangarlu uh, to discuss uh, her terrific new book, The Heartbeat of uh, Iran. Uh, Tara is an award-winning journalist uh, who has worked for NBC LA, for CNN, and for Al Jazeera America. Her writing and reporting has also appeared in uh, Time Magazine, in Vanity Fair, in Al Monitor, and in the Huffington Post. Uh, Tara is a veteran of reporting in the Middle East. He has spent a lot of time in the region covering uh, conflicts in the region, most importantly, the Syrian uh, conflict. And in particular, uh, her work has focused on Syrian refugees and, and the crisis that we have seen uh, on, on that issue uh, in the past number of years. And she's also done work on uh, the MENA region uh, at large. And uh, as a result of her work and recognition of her work in 2016, um, uh, Tara founded Art of Hope, which is the first uh, uh, American nonprofit that is strictly focused on providing trauma relief and mental health support through art therapy for Syrian ref refugees and vulnerable host communities in, in Lebanon. And after nearly four years of reporting and writing, uh, she has uh, uh, produced uh, her debut book, The Heartbeat of Iran, which was released in June uh, this summer, in June of 2021. And uh, it is an important book on Iran, much, uh, much needed at this time, and I very much recommend it. Uh, it is not a political narrative. It's not the kind of histories and, and political analysis that, that we're used to. But the book uh, uh, brings to life uh, everyday life in Iran and the people of Iran and the society in Iran, particularly at a time when we're debating the kind of impact that uh, politics as well as sanctions have had on the, on, on the Iranians. It's an eye opener. And uh, uh, Tara actually positions her book, uh, refers to it as a book which is about the heart and soul of a country. And that's a very, uh, uh, both provocative and also very, a very uh, heartwarming way of uh, thinking about the book. And uh, it, it looks past the headlines and, and, and a lot of the political discussions we're having in, on Iran to look at the reality of life in that country by looking at uh, the lives of uh, many uh, uh, Iranians. Uh, now, Tara uh, was born in Tehran, Iran, but she had uh, she has a BA in English literature from UCLA and an MA uh, in journalism from University of Southern California. And she is uh, both a Persian speaker and, and an English speaker. And uh, she she spends her time in, in, in London. So we are extremely pleased um, to, to welcome her to Rethinking in Iran and, and to discuss her book. I'll engage uh, uh, Tara in a conversation about the book, and then towards the end, uh, we will open it uh, for a question and uh, an, an answer. So uh, Tara, welcome to SAIS, welcome to our program. It's, it's really great having you here. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, uh, first of all, what attracted you to this topic? You were working on Syrians, you were working on, on refugee issues. It's an issue that you're so obviously very invested in. What what brought you to Iran and this and particularly to this this particular perspective on Iran? Good afternoon to everyone uh, joining. Thank you so much for having me, Valley, and everyone at uh, Rethinking Iran and your fantastic program, uh, which I am a big fan of. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be with you all. You know. 
uh, the reason I wanted to do this book, Rally, it, it really came from my own personal story and journey as an immigrant. Uh, you know, I consider myself both an Iranian, but also an American. But, but professionally, I'm an American journalist, right? And, and um, even before that, um, when I moved from Iran, I, I always found myself having to explain my identity you know, to my classmates, to my American counterparts. I'd always be faced with this question of, you know, uh, where, where are you from? You know, why, uh, why do you, you know, uh, your food looks this way, you know, did you do this back home? Did you do that back home? And, you know, a lot of these questions uh, were, were daunting, you know, not all of them were positive at points. They were fun, uh, you know, just uh, youthful questions, but, but there were times that um, I wondered what is it that divides Iranians and Americans so much on a basic you know, human level. And then when I became a journalist um, and you know, specifically covered the Middle East, as you mentioned, again, continuously, um, the narrative on Iran revolved around politics, the nuclear talks, which you know, are ongoing, and, and the dominant discussion and narrative that existed on the country focused on very particular events and through a very narrow prism and, and lens. Um, again, you know, uh, when, when you talk about Iran, some of the first few things that come to mind are you know, the 1979 hostage crisis, the revolution, um, you know, presidents and clerics that people can't even pronounce their names. Um, but what I always say, you know, in my mind, I always thought that Iran is a country of 80 million human beings, not 80 million nuclear heads. And that's a distinction that we often fail to make in, in the media. And, and, you know, as a journalist, I want to tell more of the human stories because I fundamentally believe um, as a reporter that storytelling is about capturing uh, you know, the perspectives of, of those on the ground in the field and capturing the nuances of what goes on in their lives. And so much of that, again, is missing in the discussion on Iran. And so when Al Jazeera America shut down um, in 2016 and you know, the previous administration was, uh, was coming in, I thought I can uh, be more of a contribution to kind of take you know take a step back uh, from sort of mainstream media and focus on writing this book, collecting these human stories that again don't exist in mass media, uh, don't don't exist in, in the day to day conversation that we have on Iran. And Bali, I want to just add to to this point um, to answer your question is that when people of a country know their counterparts elsewhere, that's when empathy comes about. That's when nations are humanized. And unfortunately, for the last 40 years, Iran has been dehumanized and militarized, right? And, and the purpose of the book is to show that the people of this country are different than, than their government, as is the case anywhere else in the world, even in the United States. And that distinction is, is a fair point and needs to be made. Um, and so uh, it was an opportunity to sort of advance the narrative on Iran and introduce a human perspective on a country that, again, is only seen through this very, very narrow political lens. Now, it, it, I was looking at your book, I was very much, um, you know, intrigued by how did you come up on these stories and these characters uh, and, and, and why them and why these particular stories, particularly in the context of what you just described? Absolutely. I mean, in the way of, you know, how, how did you identify your targets for writing? Of course. Um, you know, like you mentioned, I was born and raised in Iran, and I always say that a reporter has to live and breathe the society, community, and culture that they're reporting on, right? And um, uh, I knew the issues that I want to tackle. I knew that I knew the areas that I want to unpack, and for for many people who have read my book, um, they call it Iran within Iran within Iran. Because, like you said, it's not a political book. It's not just about culture. It's not just about women. It's not just about religion, but rather about all of that encapsulated and told by way of these individuals. So the book is a collection of twenty four individual stories. Twenty four ordinary, but some actually extraordinary Iranians who are living inside the country right now. I have to say, I interviewed about 37, but 24 made it in the book, because otherwise it would have been a very thick book. No one would buy it. Um, but, but the way I, 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 I went about finding these individuals were really um, trying to find people who would, who would 
uh, help me tell a broader story, right? Um, just to give you an example, I knew, for instance, I want to tackle the issue of child labor, um, you know, the, the current unemployment uh, that exists in Iran, how that contributes to uh, not just, of, of course, poverty and lack of opportunities for education, but also addiction, drug abuse, HIV, um, and also, um, you know, the challenges uh, of homelessness in Iran, right? And in that, there are also very many parallels with addiction um, in the United States and, you know, the large opioid addiction that, you know, uh, we've been seeing. So I knew, for example, that I, these are the, t the topics that I want to tackle. And in one chapter, I found um, a, a, a former, you know, a homeless man, uh, he no longer is, I, I want to give away the story, but it actually has a beautiful ending. However, um, all of these uh, topics would, uh, would, would be visible in his story, right? Mm -hmm. And even within that story, I give you the history of the last hundred years and I even give you the history of you know opium and I take you to Afghanistan and sort of give you this broad context and, and that's a key word valley context. I, I want to give my readers context. So when they hear about you know women's issues, when they hear about human rights, when they uh, hear about uh, you know sanctions, they understand the impact but also the context. Um, and, and, and in addition to that, um, I try to take my readers into, into the reality of life in Iran. I think there's so many scenes in the book where people can, can smell the scenes, can feel things, can see things from the perspective of the people. Um, and, uh, and so that's how I went about telling the stories um, or finding these people, really trying to tackle very specific um, uh, you know, points. Um, if, if I may give you another example, because I, I, I really want to unpack um, this great question that, that you asked. For instance, you know, in the United States, there's a dominant narrative, you know, where they're discussing the, the, the region, you know, the whole Shia Sunni uh, dilemma, right? And it was so important to me to have a Sunni Iranian in Iran and, and really take my readers into the history of, you know, uh, Arabs in Iran, um, you know, the communities that still exist, the Sunni communities, the different areas uh, that are home to, you know, some of the largest Sunni Iranians, and really give a human face to this religious minority. I sort of unpack these uh, nuances. And one of my favorite stories um, is uh, of this young Sunni environmental activist who lives in the poorest state of Iran bordering Pakistan, Afghanistan, Sistan, Manchestan, um, being raised in one of the most conservative families. And she just finished her PhD rally, all the while being blind. So in that story, I, I unpack the environmental issues that exist in Iran, uh, you know, this whole Sunni Shia uh, uh, conversation, uh, but also tap into uh, a conservative society. What is it like to be a young female uh, who's striving for a better future, who wants to, you know, get a higher degree in a conservative society? And needless to mention that her biggest fan was her father. So we're already dismantling this image that, you know, uh, fathers or men in Iran are all backward and they're not letting, you know, their girls go to school. Um, because unfortunately, those stories are, are the ones that dominate the headlines. Um, and then on top of that, the issue of disability was, was another thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, so again, all of these stories take us to, you know, Iran within Iran within Iran and unpack a host of issues. And by no means, by the way, this is a romantic, rosy image of it. Uh, you've read the book. There's so many poignant stories. There's so many challenges uh, that, that come up in each story, but all from a perspective of an individual, a human being whose dreams and hopes and and aspirations mirror those in the United States and around the world. That's fascinating. I mean, I, I was going to ask you what is your favorite story uh, <laughs> and, and, and why. Uh, so I guess, I guess you gave us, gave, 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 uh, uh, preempted that. Uh, but uh, so let me put it this way. I mean, if if you put the totality of of these stories together, and 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 you were to tell uh, the, your American audience, and, and and I know you're familiar with with the time constraint on that you have to do it fast. What is the big takeaway uh, 
about, you know, how does this define the Iranian people for somebody who reads this book? I mean, what 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 is the what do we sort of come to conclude Iranians are like? I mean, as a people in terms of, I mean, some issues you refer to like resilience, points of view, social dynamics, but sort of what, what is in your own opinion, the, the construct of, a, of, of the Iranian people that comes through these stories? I think a few points. Uh, honestly, resilience was is a repetitive theme that, that came about in my book, um, but I think, First, uh, I believe that uh, my, my uh, non-Iranian readers, especially those in America, would be surprised to know how Iranians, ordinary people, different walks of life, maneuver the daily lives inside Iran. What is it that they do every day to live under you know, the existing challenges, constraints, and, and oppression. How is it that these people are, are moving and at points thriving and, and at times of challenge, figuring out a way to move forward? And I think that that, that creativity that Iranians have developed over the last 40 years is, is commending and it's quite admirable and, and very much uh, a reflection of of this innate Iranian uh, strength and, and zeal. And also, um, there, are a lot, there are a lot of other surprises. And I think fundamentally, um, that, that leads the audience to think that, to understand that the nation, the people, ordinary Iranians, again, we're talking about a nation of 80 million, is not the same as the government and the people who we see on television. And that distinction is quite valuable and important. And ultimately, um, I hope that policymakers will read the book because I fundamentally believe that when uh, people have a humanized understanding of their counterparts, they would understand that their decision-making, these are the people whose decision-making will have an impact on, right? And they would know their counterparts. Unfortunately, right now, ordinary Americans don't, don't have an ample and accurate knowledge of ordinary Iranians. And another thing that would, would most definitely come up is that an average Iran, an average American has so much more in common with an average Iranian right now, no matter you know, how far they are from one another. I mean, in the book, I have a story of, um, if I may share, I have a story of, mm -hmm. of this young teacher. He is in his uh, mid thirties. And he's a, he's a soldier teacher, right? You know, he, he, he in the compulsory um, uh, military service, you can choose to be um, a teacher and you know, go to a vulnerable and impoverished community and you know, teach there. So he teaches in a village and um, he talks about the struggles of, of teachers in Iran, you know, and the dismal salary that they're paid and you know, the host of, host of issues and host of challenges. And I could not help but to think about the many challenges the teachers have in the United States. Of course, different settings, different countries, mm -hmm. right? We're talking about dollar versus tonan, but, but the challenges that a teacher who's passionate about educating the next generation faces and ultimately worries about how she or he or she is putting at, uh, food at the table is surprisingly similar, right? And at the same time, again, I do this a lot in the book, and this is something that I think is interesting to my American readers, is that I, go so, I, 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 tr I allow them to travel back and forth uh, present time, 100 years ago, and, you know, a couple hundred years prior, and, and understand how Iran's history has played a role in the current society and how much of those ramifications still play, um, you know, in, in today's day-to-day uh, -to -day lives of people. Um, so, so, again, back to your question, um, I think the book will give my American readers a sense of of, uh, of a humanized nation where, where its peoples have the same hopes and dreams and aspirations as them. And if only they get to know them, things may change and things will become better because fundamentally, Bali, uh, we, we know that when people don't know each other, fear arises, right? And, and mm -hmm. fear exists because of the unknown. And if only we eliminate uh, this fear by, by introducing these people to one another, I, I think we're, we're going to have a better time at uh, you know, making some changes and, and bringing about change. Very fascinating. I, I, let me ask you this. Uh, 
what what surprised you in 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 what you learned and what you you know was what what was counterintuitive to you or or when you came away away from these stories and writing them changed your perspective on something uh, about uh, about Iran. I mean, it, it, was there anything that was that that was something you didn't expect? I think I didn't expect everybody to be so excited um, to talk to me. I mean, I really didn't have any convincing to do. Of course, you know, my reputation is very, I, it, it's very to look, very easy to look me up and, you know, see if, uh, with the, the kind of work I've done. Um, uh, and, I'm, and I'm very humbled by that. You know, I'm very humbled by the fact that people were so keen to talk to me. You know, they were, they, they wanted to have their story told and they, they, and they were so trusting. And I think this, this fact might be interesting to your, to your audience yeah. uh, is that again like i said the book is you know the left the right the conservative liberal rich for everybody right um but i was very keen valley in interviewing a die-hard revolutionary you know i was very interesting uh, interested mm -hmm. in interviewing you know someone from the basish or someone from the irgc or someone who you know whose views are are contradictory to mm -hmm. you know uh, uh the masses and also contradictory to that of those in the United States, because I also think that that story is important, because fundamentally it probably would be in, in contrast with everything else in this book, right? Uh, so, and and those groups, that group and that faction, were the only folks who didn't want to talk to me. You know, surprisingly enough, um, I went in, I went to a private uh, uh, you know, elementary school in Iran, and it was it was a it was a very good school, but it, but it also had a lot of conservative families you know send their send their children there so i still were in touch with you know uh, my my classmates and and one of the 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 girls her uncle is you know an influential cleric and and i i wanted to talk to him and they were like no tara off the record happy to on the record no and i think again that's very telling why is it that those folks did not want to have their story and their side of the story shared but everybody else did everybody else who sort of, you know, uh, is going uh, on with their lives and, and wanting to come out of this isolation, wanted, wanted to share their story. So that was, that was quite interesting. It was a surprise. But another thing um, that, that I wouldn't call a surprise, but, but something that really touched me, Valley, was the fact that every time I finished a chapter, I, I couldn't help but to think about the talent that exists in that in that country. In every corner that you look, you see people who are hungry to, to join an international community, who have so much to contribute, not just to their own society, but to the region and, and you know, the global stage. And I couldn't help but to think that what will happen if they, if they rejoin the international community? If Iranian youth can, can rejoin global markets and, and thrive and meet the potential that I so see in their stories. And again, I'm not just talking about young people, but, but uh, you know, people are well in their 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, and so that was something that really uh, touched me. And, I, and I, to this day, I, it, it makes me a bit emotional. You know, what if they, they, they have that opportunity? Yeah, no, I, 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 I thought that, you know, one of the things that comes across is that um, is that how politics of the past 40 years has, has, has shaped the Iranian people. And uh, although life is very hard, uh, but there are, uh, but, but that suffering has also chiseled them in a way that, uh, that uh, has given them resilience, but also, as you mentioned, creativity, and 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 they've sort of come out of that crucible of of, of this experience as a different people, uh, uh, almost. And and sometimes I do think that you know the Iranians have transformed. I mean, and you, those of us who have spent our times outside can sense it. And I don't know if that was your experience as well. That um, that the culture is the same, the language is the same, knowledge is the same, but. But life experiences have, have have created very different, very different people. Uh, you know, uh, and I'm sure you know. Once you do, once you start your American book tour uh, uh, on the ground here, you're going to get this question a lot. That that uh, end of the day might have not been part of your formal uh, formal interviews, 
but when the camera was off, either with the people you were interviewing or as you were in a taxi going here and there or in a bus, you've heard plenty of plenty of talk about politics. So I'm wondering whether you can give us a flavor of, you know, uh, uh, beyond the sort of very high level that we see, okay, all, all Iranians dislike their government or all Iranians. Mm. But generally, you know, uh, what are the sort of sophisticated ways in which you think they think about politics, they think about America? I mean, what is the sort of political conversation that, that you learned as, as you were in the country, um, uh, sort of outside of necessarily the stories you were covering, but, but your, your sense of what you got from, from being there? Absolutely. I, I, I want to add that, uh, Val, the last time I was in Iran was in 2015 with Al Jazeera America when I was covering the nuclear talks. Uh, um, and then for the book, actually, because I knew it's going to take so long, um, I did probably 90% of my interviews um, in Istanbul because the time zone you know, is, right, is usually right. the same with Iran. And so these were a combination of you know hours and hours and hours of FaceTime and WhatsApp calls and, you know, just audio Skype calls uh, with folks, because as you know, I'm probably not, you know, the most welcome person there as, you know, an American journalist. So, yeah. um, and also that's, that's, uh, you know, uh, another uh, issue that I, that I raised with the book, uh, that even though I can't go, even though I have a particular story, you know, this, this 80 million may not share that story and, and their tale is also worth telling. But back to your question, um, uh, I think one of the, one of the uh, strengths of, the, of ordinary Iranians, you know, just daily, uh, in their daily lives is that they are able to distinguish between the American people and their government, right? They understand mm -hmm. that, that, you know, the American president, whoever he is, um, or, or, you know, the, the policymakers are not necessarily representative of, of an entire nation. So if they mm -hmm. if they resent a president, right, they, they don't have that animosity toward Americans. In fact, I, I travel the region, uh, you know, extensively, and, and I will say that Iranians are some of the most pro-American people in the world, you know, pro-American individuals. But at the same time, they understand um, that the policies of the United States is not necessarily there to benefit their well-being. And Iranians are quite savvy. They have very, uh, very uh, uh, strong memories of, of the past. Uh, you know, they have a strong command of history. So for them, you know, they remember the, the events of the last, you know, 100 years, the United States and, you know, the United Kingdom's involvement in Iran and Russia's and so on. So, so they have a very sophisticated and broad perspective of how, they, they think of the United States, but in that they are able to distinguish between, you know, a nation and, and its government. And, and again, when it comes to their own government, um, of course, everybody is so fed up with, with the current regime and their, you know, the government. Um, but, but again, it's so just, just incredible to watch how people uh, move forward. And, and some of those stories are, extremely sad and, and tragic and and, um, and and some of them are inspiring and in the book I tried to give give both flavors um, of, of, of how how that exists and I really leave it to the reader value the reader would have the opportunity to judge to see through uh, the prism of this human being's life and how the challenges struggles um, are affecting him or her and how they're moving beyond. Um, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, I, I think because, you know, for many observers, uh, especially uh, in, the, in the West, and I guess this is sort of an underlying assumption that led to, let's say, the maximum pressure sanction strategy is, uh, is, is you know, how is the Iranian people reacting uh, politically to, to um, the situation that it's under, you know, mm -hmm. whether they lay the blame on their own government or lay the blame on the United States, or often people uh, look at riots or uprisings in Iran and expect a repeat of 1979 revolution. And there's also open questions about how do Iranians even survive the conditions mm -hmm. they're in, from COVID to lack of jobs to inflation, 
to lack of food and and I and and you know so that's an open question in other words why, why isn't these people why aren't the Iranians rebelling and how do they survive uh, and I think there's a lot of that in your book I mean at, 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 a, at a personal level that that, um, that 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 idea of resilience but I think the enigma is why I mean uh, mm -hmm. and I guess you know there are parallels with Syrians you've worked on as well although they did rebel but but they also are suffering enormously and um of and, course and, and that but but for many americans these are the questions you know there was no absolutely absolutely and they're all very important and fair questions um and i think this you know we can uh, probably would beg for a longer discussion but i think a few points that i would, would like to highlight is that any uprising as we've seen in the last couple of years has been brutally cracked down has been mm -hmm. brutally met by the forces of the regime i mean you and i both know mm -hmm. the strength that they have you know the, the military apparatus in iran is is incredibly sophisticated powerful, yeah. incredibly powerful um and and every single uprising in one shape or form has been led by you know an immediate crackdown right and at the same time um uh, you know, based on my reporting and, and speaking to uh, folks in the country, they don't have trust in outside forces either. You know, they have mm -hmm. learned that the, the United States is not there to come and save them or rescue them because they look at Syria, they look at Yemen, pardon, Iraq, or of course, Yemen, but also Afghanistan right now. So they don't think that anyone else outside feels sorry for them. So there's this disillusionment that exists in Iran right now, especially these days with COVID. I did I did very uh, uh, sort of in-depth piece on, on COVID for Time Magazine recently. And, and categorically, the sense of disillusionment and depression was dominant across all boards. And, and you cannot expect uh, a nation who's so uh, uh, saddened and, and, and disillusioned and vulnerable economically to rise. People are struggling to make ends meet. People are, are not able to put food on their table. And, and, and quite frankly, I don't think um, you know, they, they are able to, to lose everything they have for a promise of something that they may never have. If, if that makes sense. Um, and that's a sense that I got, but, but again, that doesn't mean that they are happy with the regime. I don't think anyone is in, in Iran, except a very you know, small faction of a society um, that are you know, diehard revolutionaries, their lifeline uh, belongs to, you know, the government is tied to, to um, the, the governing body and you know, they make their money uh, from, from you know the the status quo. So that's but that's a very small uh, percentage of of the Iranian society, a small yet powerful faction. But the rest of the society is not that, and they're falling prey to you know the behavior and the policies of their own government. But at the same time, they know that you know nobody else cares about them, and and that's quite disheartening to be honest with you. And that takes me back to my my initial point that I was saying that imagine the contribution that the Iranians can make, not just to their own country, but the region and the global economy, the global uh, community, if only they have the opportunity. Um, and, um, and I think focusing on the youth, creating empathy toward Iranians, uh, creating a, a humanized window into, uh, you know, uh, the daily lives of people, those are perhaps ways to, to bring about change. Valley, I was having this conversation with, with, this, uh, with a young uh, person, um, you know, who, who works on um, economic engagement with Iran and, um, you know, he's based in the U.S. And, you know, this was when the book was coming out. And I was just wondering if, you know, they'd like to uh, write something about the book. And you know what he told me? He said, oh, we focus on the economy. We focus on sanctions. We focus on commerce. So kind of like, no, thank you. And, you know, I, I didn't respond to this. Um, but then I, I thought, you know what? You can engage, you can have economic engagement if parties know each other, if the other party would know the people they're dealing with, if they would know the potential that exists there. So the more the other side has a humanized and, and nuanced and texture understanding of Iran, 
the more opportunities can come, even you know, economic, commercial, and sort of, you know, non-political related stuff. So I don't think you can make any move without knowing your counterparts and, and the people that you're dealing with. And that really comes uh, down to, you know, understanding the current society in Iran. And it's very, very true. Um, we also have a group of questions here, and, and I'm going to go to them as, as, as they come up. So it's a great question, which asks, uh, how do you see the future given the generational divide in Iran? Uh, the young people, old people, um, and I wanna sort of maybe add a layer on top of that, which is, uh, you know, it's very interesting to, to hear what your thoughts are about what might be the differences, tensions, commonalities between uh, uh, young people and, you know. and the older generation, but also, you know, what are the differentiations between young people? And I know you worked on Syria as well, because when we say youth in the Middle East, mm. we still sort of think of youth as just one, one bucket uh, defined by age. But, but I want to sort of ask you whether you've seen differences based on not just region, and, and, and uh, ethnicity, et cetera, but also based on class and, and, and social background, et cetera. And, uh, and, and even all, whatever reflection you have on how, this, how the youth in particular sees these sets of issues that you raised. Uh, and and what, can we expect, uh, what can we expect as this generation gradually is, is up and coming uh, and whether there'll be more more ready for change and if change, what sort of change? Absolutely. I think uh, when speaking about religion, uh, one of the things that was quite mind boggling for me spending time in the region was that, um, you know, the many Syrian, Iraqi, you know, Yemeni youth that I met, they were quite uh, religious actually, even though they were you know, pro-democracy, pro-reform, uh, progressive individuals, educated. Uh, it was interesting to see that they still have religious values, right? We're not talking about conservatism or um, sort of phonetic ways of thinking about religion, but, but faithful, you know, they were religious, but at the same time they were educated, you know, pro-democracy and so on. Um, and that to me was always a big point of contrast with Iran, because it's, you know, there's a running joke that um, in Iran that, you know, one of the biggest things that the Islamic revolution and the Islamic regime did in the last couple of years is that it made everybody so anti-Islam and anti-religious. And, and this is something that I touch in my book um, that, that, you know, I, 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 Take my readers into you know 70 years ago or 60 years ago you know during uh, the last uh, uh, regime you know when when the Shah was there uh, you know you would still have religious ceremonies you know there were religious uh, groups there were religious events and you know people would respect it whereas now it has just become a circus and people have have become so resentful toward religion because they see uh, that as a source of all their oppression and you know all their challenges because unfortunately uh, the government uh, you know plays this political game under this guise of religion so, so that was uh, that's an interesting nuance and uh, an interesting thing that that uh, you know it always strikes me when I when I uh, uh, travel or or go to the region and I have to say that in Iran you know the more you move to rural areas the more you know religious people. Uh, you see and you have, and again, that's something I, I touch on in my book. But but you also, and in your question, and the question from the the audience member, we talked about the uh, uh, the old generation and the young generation, and, and I want to point out to one interesting story that I think would exemplify this contrast. That I that I hope when the when folks who read the book would get a astute understanding of this con with these uh, contradictions. Um, in my book, um, I told the story of this young girl who grew up in, in an incredibly conservative family. Again, that sort of 10% you know, ultra conservative, diehard revolutionaries who go chant, you know, death to Israel, death to America, those people that we see on TV. So she was born into that family. She, she would you know, she was part of the student Basij, even in the university in the early days, um, she was part of the student Basij. She, she was the one who would go ask students or females to, you know, pull their scarves. Really, a type that someone, you know, like me or the average Iranian would, would 
you know, uh, want to stay away from, right? But in the book, I, I chronicle and unpack how this incredibly conservative young woman evolves into this very educated, secular uh, new person that has, that, that has found a way to break away from this, what she calls colony, colony of people that have nothing in common with her. And, and now she's a kindergarten teacher. Um, you know, she listens to Pink Floyd and you know, all the, the American classics and, and European classics and reads uh, French literature um, and uh, teaches art. And this is a girl that uh, told me that in, in her, her home growing up, they didn't have any CD, no music, no cassettes, nothing, except uh, for you know, different variations of uh, religious books and, and you know, or on and whatever her father um, deemed permissible, right? And I think this story really gives readers um, an interesting uh, contrast between you know, the old generation and the new generation, but also within you know, this sort of conservative sect of the society. Um, but at the same time, I think um, there are some values that uh, will forever live on in the lives of Iranians. You know, there, there are some uh, values and attributes that, that will continue to pass from the old generation to the young generation. And I think part of that is the, the respect that, um, you know, children have for their families. I think so many young people stay in Iran and choose to remain in their homeland, again, despite all the restrictions, all the confinements and, and um, challenges, simply because of their family ties and their, and their parents. Um, I uh, feature this fantastic young Jewish uh, female entrepreneur who you know, has all the opportunities to leave Iran, because as you know, you know religious minorities can, can have the opportunities to leave. Um, but she chose to stay. She chose to stay because she wanted to be close to her family. And so these are the isms and nuances that I think would, would unpack um, so many of these questions that, that exist in the minds of our American friends um, and you know, essentially the West. Um, and, and I always say that Iran is not a monotone society. It's one of the most complex and nuanced uh, societies that, that, quite frankly, I've, I've uh, experienced living in. I think you're on mute. I, I actually wonder whether uh, the, the economic hardships that actually made uh, particularly younger people become more dependent on on families you know as if they can't get their own home or they can't um, uh, uh, have their own uh, and then have a job etc is that they go back to their to the parents and particularly also on another side you know we know rate of divorce in Iran is pretty high yes. and and the, so the, the sort of formation and movement of new families is a bit fraught uh, so, so yeah, I, I think those are sort of interesting things that also um, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the social social pressures are also uh, uh, formative uh, in that way. Uh, I have another question, which which says, uh, how do we dispel uh, misconceptions about Iran within the public sphere? Of course, your book is a, My is book. a very good <laughs> is a very good uh, start, and and I would very definitely memorable. recommend it. Yes, um, and. Um, but, but, you know, more broadly, uh, beyond your book, and, and obviously your book is part of this effort, but as a journalist, etc., and, and you're in the business of opinion making, and, um, you know, how do we, how, how can we get, uh, you know, the media to sort of look at Iran, not, not uh, as a sort of, uh, uh, through the prism of its government, and uh, and how do we sort of humanize the people of Iran or, or, or the country? Um, so so if, if any thoughts you have or any experiences you gain uh, in in media that might be helpful. Absolutely, and and I really appreciate that question. I want to share an anecdote with you. Um, I was at one of the networks that I was working um, in, and we were covering. Uh, 
Assad's use of chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that I wanted to ask the, uh, the, the guest was uh, the United States involvement in selling you know, chemical weapons to Saddam Hussein mm -hmm. during the Iran Iraq war. And you know, right then and there, um, somehow magically the, uh, the time uh, was up so we couldn't get that to that uh, question. Um, so, so there are so many uh, limits uh, when it comes to the news telling of the story of Iran, right? And that's why um, I, I chose to sort of leave mainstream news and focus on storytelling. And I do believe that arts, culture, literature, um, and academic work uh, really can have an impact in changing uh, the narrative and dismantling um, this very dark um, and, and bleak and, and politicized view that we have on Iran. I mean, Bali, why is it that every single film that we have on Iran, um, you know, it's, it's uh, either has to do with, the, again, the nuclear issue, we, we have the series Tehran, Argo, 300, or, you know, every, just others that, that again, are, are political. They are, are in ways dehumanizing Iranians. And I think, that's our responsibility as Iranian Americans, as you know, those right. in the diaspora, academics, uh, journalists, storytellers, to focus on introducing alternative narratives. And you know what you're doing at Rethinking Iran, I think, is a fantastic step. Um, and uh, and conversations like this that would also give credibility and seriousness to these sort of discussions and storytelling, right? Because people mm -hmm. think, okay, we only need to talk about politics or policy making if we want to be taken seriously or if we want to you know, have a seat at the table or, or we want to bring about change. But no, I think we need to talk about people. We need to talk about the commonalities. We need to talk about the contributions that, that people can have to one another's lives and how their uh, livelihoods can impact you know, someone else's around the world. And, and so arts, literature, culture, um, all of this play a role. And you know, one of my dreams was that the people in this book, especially those within the sort of you know, academic arts, culture, and uh, sports, um, can can perhaps come to the U.S. and and we can have this cultural exchange. Obviously, that's, that's quite difficult, but um, the, I, I put so much value in cultural engagement and um, and uh, you know I look at the sort of Muslim American community or the Arab American community. They have done so well in the last couple of years um, to sort of dismantle the negative image of of perhaps um, average average American toward their community. And I wonder. What can we do to do that as well? Um, I, I don't want to be nervous when someone at the bookstore, you know, at the airport asks me, um, you know, what, what's the book you're looking for? I don't want to say, oh, the hard book, Iran, you know, oh, Iran again. I don't want to mention that because they're going to think of something negative. I hope that we can create an environment where the word Iran is not solely uh, synonymous with uh, the country's current government, but rather its people, it, their potential, and its rich heritage, arts and culture, and um, you know the the, the vast uh, richness that, that's embedded in that country. Right. So th there is the question about minorities. The mm -hmm. question is about whether they can leave or not, but that might not be uh, necessarily something. Uh, that's your in your in your uh, 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 area, but but I but I want to sort of maybe expand it and 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 to ask you, you know, what do people's what do you how do you see average Iranians' view of minorities and and particularly there's also minorities that the that that the regime in Iran has not recognized and have been under particular pressure, like the Baha'is. Uh, did, did these come up or did you encounter firsthand experiences? That can that can tell us something about uh, the the sort of dynamic of relations between minority majorities or even among the minorities themselves. Absolutely, hundred um, percent. I don't think I could do the book without touching on on, on this very important issue. And and in fact, I do uh, bring up the uh, you know the challenges that. Uh, for instance, the Baha'i uh, community has in Iran, uh, because in the book um, I uh, talk about you know the Jewish community, the Sunni community, uh, the Christian community, the Christian Armenian community. Um, uh, 
one of my another favorite story. I guess I have so many favorite stories in the book, but but I but I um, tell the story of this young, uh, very hip cafe owner um, because I really wanted to to uh, capture the, the vibrant food culture in Iran, mm -hmm. uh, who happens to be uh, a Christian Armenian, um, you know, youth in Iran. And he tells us, he takes us to the Armenian community. And I take you to the history of, of uh, Armenians in Iran, when they came um, and sort of, you know, give you that history and even take you further back. Um, so yes, in the book, I tackle um, the, the sort of religious minorities um, uh, in various ways. Um, and also, uh, I think many people would be surprised to know that Iran is home to the largest number of, uh, uh, largest number of Jews outside of Israel in the Middle East. And of course, that number is, is significantly smaller than what it was 40 years ago, but there's still you know, uh, Jewish people living in Iran. And I think it's worth knowing how, why do they stay? Why didn't they leave? What's their life like? And, and um, I tackled this um, in the book. Um, there's a great story of this young rabbi. Again, he's not old. He's um, I think now in his late thirties. And, you know, he's, he was educated in Israel. He was educated in Maryland, but he chose to go back to Iran. And I, and the question I wanted to ask was why? Why did you go back? You know, wh wh why did you want to live there? And in the in the book, I tell these stories. Um, and and again, like I said earlier, these these are not rosy stories to say uh, to to give another kind of stereotypes to say, oh look, you know, we have this in Iran. No, no, no. It's it's an example of 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 how life continues and what challenges exist and how people maneuver these these challenges mm -hmm. um so so yes i uh, in the book there there are many many mentions of religious minorities by the way not just religious but also i um i um, take my readers into the lgbtq community in iran and in the book um i tell the story mm -hmm. of this young, yeah. young gay man and uh, a transgender woman so so all of these issues i i try to uh, be truthful to uh, and and capture so just uh, w without giving the ending of a book, but, I, but I'm yeah. curious, for instance, on the case of that particular young rabbi that you mentioned, yes. uh, what, what, is, uh, what is the reason why he went back? And, and, and you know, we know obviously a lot of uh, Iranian Jews migrated either to the United States or to Israel after mm -hmm. the 1979 revolution. But for those who have stayed, what has kept them in Iran? Right. Um, before I answer that question, I also want to want to mention that, you know, these people are living in Iran, right? So I'm sure their answers were yes, somehow yes. filtered, right? In a sense, uh, they, they, they gave me answers that uh, would not really get them in trouble, right? And the way I told the story um, is, is respectful to their interview, but as a journalist, you have context, I give you history, and you really, really would see the big picture, right? Yeah. So to answer your question, um, the rabbi, the reason he went back, um, it, was, it was so fascinating. He told me, he said, you know, Tara, there were so many old rabbis in Iran that, that made me want to be the youngest rabbi who teaches Torah beyond the sort of old academic way. I wanted to modernize Judaism. I wanted to train you know, young generations of rabbis, cool rabbis. And I thought, oh, okay, well, I know cool rabbis in New York. I guess he wants to do that. Um, and, you know, he was really close to his father, who was a physician. And, you know, he, he makes his living, by the way, by renting the property of his father, who passed a couple of years ago. So he doesn't make any money by his uh, you know, yeah. work as a rabbi, right? And and I think that's just such a universal story of you know someone caring about his community, about his faith, um, about his family. And again, in that, I, I unpack the, the many challenges that, of course, religious minorities faced. But um, that was his answer. Fascinating. Well, uh, we're almost close to the end of our time. I, I mean, I, and, I, and I think, you know, you, you, you do a fantastic job of uh, showing the tapestry of uh, the, the sort of rich tapestry of diversity in Iran. And then you, you draw a picture of the people who are resilient, who, uh, who have developed this resilience. And, and, and you 
give a suggestion about how are they dealing with the adversity, political, social, economic, that they are, that they are confronting. Um, and I think it's important for all Americans, Iranian Americans, and even as you mentioned, policymakers to read it, largely because in the, I think in the past four or five years, if not from much before that, uh, the Iranian people have been made the, the sort of subject of American foreign policy. So the sanctions are directed at getting them to do something. Or we have all these questions about why aren't they revolting and then when they will revolt and, and uh, why are they doing this and that, et cetera. And, and if they are the subject of our policy, then we ought to know them and we ought to know what the impact of the, that policy is. So, I mean, I really liked your approach just because it's very personable and it's, it, it's easier to relate to for many Americans. And so I recommend it very um, strongly to all our, uh, to, to everybody to, yeah. to read the book. And I wanna thank you for, uh, for giving us your time and joining us for this session. And we hope to, uh, you know, have you in person at another occasion uh, at SAIS. Thank, thank you very you so much. much. And thank thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye.